Good morning, everybody. Good morning, good morning, good morning. Happy Saturday and all of that good stuff. I am licensed couple marriage and family therapist and sports mental health empowerment coach, Dr. Lauren Pitts. My co-host is back. Uh, you know what, Ronnie? What's Let up? me just say, Savannah, she, she, she held it down for you. I, she did. I, I did get a chance to listen and I, I meant... She I'm did. Glad to, I'm glad we were able to meet Savannah and that she's able to, you know, come back on the show and contribute. Yeah, she, she you owe really her one, bro. Because she, she came in, she was she was the pinch hitter, and she held that thing down, and we had a great conversation. Um, folks, it you know what? I'm about to be a smarty pants. <laughs> That's just why I am in touch with my authentic self. Mm. So I was gonna say, um, this is the last Saturday in Black History Month, but folks need to stop their foolishness. Every day is Black History Month. I was talking, <laughs> I was talking to one of my colleagues who is of a different hue. And we were talking about, you know, racism all over the world and the impact that that the former president that we had. Um, and, and just how the hatred and the racism, it is an all time high. And from what I'm understanding, it's um, it's being directed at Native Americans up in Canada. And it's just a mess. Mm -hmm. It's a mess all over the place. And I was talking about how hateful people are and, and just spreading all of it. And I said, you know, it's interesting because you you hear people spewing all of this hatred and they, what they really are demonstrating is just how ignorant they are. And they're telling us to go back to Africa as if, you know, we came here of our own volition in the first place. And I said, well, how awesome would it be, right, if we could take the genie bottle, the bottle and rub it and get three wishes and that we could actually go back to the motherland. But we take all of the stuff that we invented with us. Mm. Everything. Mm. That, look. Ha, everything look everything's crumbling because wasn't this country built on the backs of slaves hmm. and i was like so so then what so we we leave we look like that you know how to do in the movies and you you <laughs> you're gone and everything that was built on the backs of our ancestors goes back with us i said then what then then, then what's gonna happen I will, anyway. if, if, if we were if we were to do that to go back to the motherland and you know take all the inventions we made over here let me just read off a couple just Please. so people understand what exactly so, <laughs> first and foremost the first the first big problem that america would have if we all left is there would be no traffic lights anymore like, that's the one i always say first we can, too. we can shout out to garrett morgan for creating the three-way traffic signal back in 1923 mm -hmm. uh closed circuit television Mm. Mailboxes, mm. uh, laser Mail cataract the surgery, the touch tone phone, the super soaker, mm. 3D special effects, the blood bank, refrigerated trucks, and so many other things. Mm -hmm. So many, and like we said, like we said to kick off Black History Month, you know, yeah, we know that we have a month and it's cool and we celebrate and all that, but like we said, there is no American history without Black history because right. our history is the history that matters in this country and our history is the reason that this country is able to well at least for some people flourish and thrive the way it does because of the the work and the sacrifices that our ancestors made hundreds of years ago so you know i don't, I don't think we i don't think they can afford for us to leave i don't think so no nope. you know? i'm inclined to believe they cannot but, but, you know, I, but I, I will i will say to people you know to wrap up black history month and, and things like that you know, one of the things I always like to tell people is, you know, we, our, our genetic makeup, our, who we are, our personalities, our souls, our spirits, our culture, you can't, you can't put a price on it. You can't put a description on it because you just have to be there to experience or live it to really understand how powerful it is. I always tell people, you know, it's, it's one thing when, you know, in maybe one country or two countries, you know, people are oppressed and stuff like that. But when the world tries to oppress you because they see your light, they see your magic, they see your potential, you know, you have something powerful. That's right. And I always challenge our people like, you know, I understand people want to have their own individual successes and stuff like that. 
But what's individual success if you have nobody to celebrate with? That's right. You know, what 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 is the price of those individual successes if you don't have family around you, if you don't have your people around you to celebrate and, and bask in that with you? Mm-hmm. So, you know, as much as we, you know, celebrate those who have made it, we also need to celebrate those who have come back and gave, and gave back you know, to uplift our communities and the people that are doing the good work now to uplift our communities. Um, And speaking of Black History Month, uh, special shout out yesterday to uh, Miss Kentaji Brown Jackson, who yesterday was announced by Joe Biden as his uh, Supreme Court nomination. And if confirmed, she will be the first African-American woman to sit on the Supreme Court uh, bench. So um, shout out to her. I would like to think that she that she most likely will get confirmed and get you know um, initiated into the Supreme Court and stuff like that. So shout out to her, and then shout out to all the other wonderful people out there in the world, African Americans, Amer- African people all over the world who are doing great things, not only in February yeah. but the other eleven months of the year too. Um, How about that? <laughs> and we'll definitely you know we'll definitely continue to celebrate you know Black History Month you know throughout the year and things like that. Mm-hmm. But um, you know. I, I really like how we're closing out Black History Month and, you know, February, Lover's Month, the Love Month and all that, because our topic for today is a really good one. And we have a, a very special guest with us here that we're going to introduce in a second to talk more about that, because I always tell people, you know, when it comes to, you know, feelings and emotions and things like that, you, it's hard for people to really grasp that until you learn how to grasp it and understand it for yourself. And I think this is a very important topic that we're talking about today, it's the topic of self-love. And we know self-love is a state of appreciation for oneself that grows from actions that support our physical, psychological, and spiritual growth. Self-love means having a high regard for your own well-being and happiness. Mm-hmm. Self-love can mean something different for each person because we all have many different ways to take care of ourselves. So figuring out what self-love looks like for you as an individual is an important part of your mental health journey and your life journey. So we have a very special guest here, Marcus McDuffie, who is, who is going to be talking to us today, well, talking with us today about self-love and how you yourself can find that true self-love within yourself to find peace, happiness, and understanding within your mm-hmm. own life. Um, so we're very happy to have him on the show today. We're going to be introducing him and having him talk in a few. Um, Dr. Pitts, do you want, you said you want me to go first for the mental health tip of the week this week? Yeah. Okay. Because cool, I missed cool. you last week. I was going through Ronnie with Carol. I'm, uh, I'm, I'm, I missed you last week as well, and I missed being on the show last week, but I'm so happy to be back this week because I had to come back for this one because I, I really harp self-love to a lot of people yeah. and the importance of self-love. And speaking of self-love, so I was telling Dr. Pitts before the show started what my mental health tip of the week was, and so it it, it ties into self-love, and, and I'm, and I'm going to explain it. So what I told Dr. Pitts was is that procrastination can lead to perfectionism. And when I told her, she was like, well, perfectionism is a bad thing. And I was like, exactly. But why does procrastination lead to perfectionism? Mm-hmm. I was talking to somebody earlier this week and you know, they were telling me they have a hard time you know, procrastinating and things like that. And so I was asking them, I was like, you know, what are some of the reasons that you do procrastinate? He was talking about schoolwork. You know, he was like, you know, I get schoolwork and, you know, I'll wait till the day of or, you know, literally the you know hour before to get it turned in by midnight and stuff like that. Marcus, I don't know if that was something that you dealt with in school where, you know, it's like, you know, you get that paper at the beginning of the semester. You know, you got to the end of the semester to do it and you wait till the last day of the semester to get it done. Exactly. exactly. And and I was I was that person to Dr. Piss. I don't know if you was that person. You don't strike me as that person who will wait. Till Absolutely the last not. I was the person that turned everything in early. <laughs> Oh yeah, you know, no, only, reset it. <laughs> the only thing, the only, uh, the only assignment that was getting done early was me looking at it to see what it was. That was the only thing that was getting done early. So then I could do what I was supposed to start. <laughs> <laughs> and one of the things I used to tell myself when it came to procrastinating was, is when I procrastinate and I wait till the very last minute, I do my very best work. And I used to really brag about that. Like, if I wait to the last minute, I have no choice but to do great work. And you know. At first, I would get rewarded for that great work. You know, I would get A's on papers and things like that. So in my mind, well, hell, if I'm waiting to the last minute and I'm getting good grades and stuff, well, this must be working. But let me tell you what that does internally. So on the outside, you know, cool, calm, composed and all that. On the inside, my anxiety is on a trillion because now I know that because I procrastinated, I've BS'd all these days, BS'd all these opportunities to get something done ahead of time and not have to rush. 
Now my anxiety is skyrocketing because now I have no choice but to get this right the first time. Now, with that, like I said, at first I was getting rewarded for that positive in a, in a in a positive way because I would get good grades, I would get positive feedback. But that person didn't know what I did, you know, beforehand. They didn't know that I waited to the very last minute to get this done. So in my mind, I'm thinking things work. And it wasn't until I had that first assignment that I didn't do good on, or I missed an assignment because I procrastinated that I learned that. I would defeat myself and I would sabotage myself because I thought that if I didn't do it right the first time, if I didn't get it right and I had to go back and do it, that it wasn't no point in doing it. So I would just be, you know what, whatever. And I started to have in somewhat a perfectionist mindset because I felt like, well, I know I'm good enough to do this. So I just have to do this right the first time. I say all to say, part of practicing self-love is recognizing when you are sabotaging yourself and doing things that you know will be detrimental to your growth and progress. I always tell people procrastination can be a good thing in a sense that if you are somebody who takes on a lot of work, if you take on things and you take things, whether it's taking work home and stuff like that, and you get burnt out, sometimes procrastinating can be a thing where you know, if it's not a major priority, I can put this to the side until another day so I can get my priorities done. However, if you use procrastination and procrastinate on your responsibilities, things that actually matter to you, your family, your loved ones and all that, then that's when it becomes a problem. So if you recognize that you are somebody who procrastinates, like to put things off to the last minute, whether it's because you have self-doubts about your abilities or your, or your uh, talents to do something, whether you feel like, I just don't have the energy to do this, mm-hmm. be able to recognize and pull yourself out of that in that moment. We talk about, you know, me and Dr. Pitts, when we work with clients, mindfulness and things like that, being understanding that if you get anxious or you start to have resentment or guilt about things in the past, pull yourself to the present ground yourself, recenter yourself and refocus yourself to like, look, what's important right now in this moment? What can I do right now to get things done so that way I can have the free time I need to clear my mind and work on other things? But if you continue to procrastinate and you continue to do those things, yes, you can possibly develop a perfectionist mindset if you feel like you only have one time to get things right. And if that's the case, that's okay. Admitting it and acknowledging is the first step to to reverse and address anything that we're going through in our lives. So if you feel like this is something that is, is, is affecting you and it's, and it's affecting your ability to have self-love, then let's talk about that. Whether it's me, Dr. Pitts, or even Marcus, anybody that you can have somebody that can hold you accountable to it. Look, I think you might be sabotaging, bro. I think you might be putting this off a little bit too much. You know, when you put things off, you know how you get, you get flustered, you get frustrated, you get thrown off, your attitude changes, your demeanor changes. How about you do a little bit each day so that way you don't have to carry this large burden at the last minute. So that's my mental health tip of the week. Do not allow your procrastination to turn you into a perfectionist because it will rob you of your self-love. You put a powerful spin on that because I, when you first said it to me, I was like, I have no idea where he's going with this, but I know he's going to iron it out and make it real clear for everybody to understand. That was good. That was really, really good. Um, and, and my guess would be that people actually hadn't thought about it like that because you the the procrastination which a lot of people do and the the perfectionism which you know the first thing that I said to you when you said that to me is like you said "Mm, that's bad that's that's a bad thing and it's and it's a cognitive distortion that many people have that you know they're striving for perfection I said well good luck with that let me let me know how that works out for you because you know it's the more you try to achieve it, the further it gets away from you. It's just, mm. it's humanly impossible. So, you know, strive for excellence and greatness. Thank you, Ronnie. No so doubt, no doubt. my mental health tip of the week is, um, is also connected to self-love, um, but it's looking at self-love within the context of negativity bias and how beneficial having self-compassion can be. So, you know, when I think about in, in honor of, of Black History Month, when I think about so many of the plights that we as a people have experienced for decades, centuries, really, um, it, it, it's almost understandable why we as a people could perhaps be more prone to negativity bias, right? Where we have seen our family members in many instances for multiple generations struggle and and claw and, you know, 
the civil rights movement and being bit by dogs and hosed and lynched and slavery and all of these things. It makes sense why people would, would get into that place and space where they expect bad things to happen. And I think the mistake that some people make is they get so caught up in all of the negativity that we've experienced as a people that they start to believe, gentlemen, that we don't deserve the luxury of happiness. And because they think that we don't deserve the luxury of happiness, it becomes very easy to adopt that internal negative narrative that says, you know what, I'm not worthy of love. I'm not worthy of respect and honor and appreciation and adoration in the whole nine yards. And, and I think what's a slippery slope with this is that even for those of us that were fortunate enough to be taught how to love ourselves and respect ourselves and value ourselves and appreciate ourselves in our homes, then for many kicks in abuse, neglect and maltreatment, whether it be in the home, in the community, at the hands of abusive police and abusive judicial system or whatever the case may be. So it really becomes this vicious cycle. But I'm sure that many people have heard it said, the things that we've been through individually mm -hmm. and as a people, they're what happened to us. Those things don't define us. And it's in that place of allowing the atrocities that we have experienced as a people and the individual hurts and pains and traumas that, that we've many of us have endured that allow people to buy into the lie that we're not worthy. And one of the things that I teach my clients when I'm working with them around self-love and overcoming negativity bias is this, that again, first and foremost, the things that have happened to you do not define you. But in addition to that, you have to remember that where your thoughts go, your energy flows. And if all you're doing is just sitting in the ick of all of the horrible things that have happened to you, you are literally expending energy that should be directed towards self-compassion and loving yourself unconditionally. Because if you don't love yourself unconditionally, it, it kind of makes it hard for other people to. Why? Because you said the magic word, self-sabotage. When people do not love themselves, they get over in to self-sabotage. So what I want to tell you is that the, the solution, regardless of what you've been through in your life, I am not in any way, shape, form, or fashion being dismissive or insensitive to the things that you've been through. But what I'm telling you is that self-compassion begins by realizing that each and every one of us has the right to be happy. We, we need to know that. We need to wrap our heart, mind, spirit, and soul around it. it happiness, folks, the, 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 the mm -hmm. joy and peace that comes from loving yourself unconditionally, it is not an entitlement. It is a birthright. Mm -hmm. And it does not matter that we live in a society that tells us otherwise. You have the right to have the audacity to love yourself unconditionally, no matter what has happened to you, and to demonstrate self-compassion every minute of every day of your life, because you get to choose whether or not you're going to allow the heartache, pain, suffering, and traumatic experience of your past to define you. And I am telling you that they don't. Choose to have self-compassion and to love yourself unconditionally and we're going to tell you how to do that today. That's all I have. <clears throat> see, see, Marcus, see, this is why I go first. If we do mental health tips of the week, this is why I go first, because well, what will happen is, you know, I always say chivalry isn't dead and I'll let her go first. And then she spits out an uh, a quill. Uh, what's the word? Um, what's the poem word I'm looking for? The liquid. Can't think of it right now. There we go. So, uh, so, uh, so, whatever that word is. Yes. Yeah, she little, be doing that, and then she expect me to go right after her, and like I'm gonna say anything that's relevant after that. <laughs> so, so you know, 
Thank you, Dr. Pence. That was very beautiful. And we will definitely be getting more into how you can work on self-compassion and self-love yeah. in a few. Um, so uh, HBCU news of the week. So um, Dr. Pence, I know you wanted to go first. I know you had some news to share. Yeah, 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 yeah. I, it's a family affair at Jackson State, y'all. Uh -oh. It is a family affair. Star shooting guard Shalomi Sanders will join brothers Shador and Shiloh, as well as head football coach Father Deion Sanders at Jackson State University. Uh, Shalomi is a standout women's basketball star and daughter of Jackson State University head football coach Deion Sanders. She committed to attend Jackson State. She's five foot seven. She's a shooting guard who's graduating this year from Rockwell Heath High School right here in Texas. And Wow. She, she's rocking a shirt that, that they got her a, a, a uniform looking shirt that says committed on it in all caps. They doing it, aren't they? Oh, I was like, okay. Okay. Sure. I stay, look, keeping <clears throat> money in the family. <laughs> hey, I, all, I, all I know is, is, you know, uh, Dion is really doing the thing down there in Jackson State. Yeah, yes. You know, we, we've talked about this, you know, him building up <laughs> uh, a legacy down there and hopefully yeah. creating a system that will continue yeah. to flourish long after he is no longer there. Yeah. Um, that's what's up. Um, the HBC, well, so um, the CIAA basketball tournament um, wraps up today for the men's. Uh, yesterday, the, uh, um, I want to say it was Elizabeth City State women's team beat uh, mm -hmm. Virginia State's women's team in the CIAA uh, okay. women's okay. tournament final for the CIAA championship. Virginia mm -hmm. Union plays today against Fayetteville State's boys team, well, okay. men's team, I'm sorry, not boys team, men's team. Mm -hmm. um, today for the uh, CIAA men's championship. So shout out to both of those teams playing today. Um, mm -hmm. I do not know about the uh, SWAC or the um, the yeah. MEAC, what their tournaments are looking like. Mm -hmm. But I will say out of the MEAC, for those who uh, pay attention to March Madness and stuff, do not be shocked if Norfolk State wins the MEAC and goes to the NCAA tournament and upsets somebody. Okay. As a 16 they, doing 15, the North they have been balling this year. Norfolk yeah. State got a squad. Good. They have a squad. So shout out to Lowell State down in Norfolk. Um, mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, I think that's all the HBCU news I had. Oh, I did see something where um, the uh, federal government is giving Kentucky State, I think $23 million to um, help keep the school open. Um, okay. So shout out to them for that. Um, I hope they can, you know, definitely use those funds appropriately yeah. to, you know, keep the school up and running and whatnot. Yeah. Shout out to the thoroughbreds in Kentucky. Um, I think that was all the HBCU news I had. Um, yeah, so let's go ahead and get into this. So like we said, y'all, we have a very special guest with us this morning. Actually, it is super early for him, and we are super <laughs> thankful that that he just you know that he decided to join us because it is the crack of dawn over there in sunny Los Angeles, California. So, like I said, our special guest for today is Marcus McDuffie. He is a black business owner out of Pasadena, California, who runs a fitness studio for people forty and up. Now, I did ask Marcus, ladies and gentlemen, if you are slip. thirty-nine and a half. You can be put on the wait list. All right. You can be, he got a wait list for 39 and a half. Just like your uh your 401k, you can't touch it till you're 59 and a half. But he got you at 39 and a half. But Marcus grew up in Riverside, California, and moved to LA to go to Occidental College, which is a D3 school in uh, Los Angeles, Los Angeles, California, where he played football. Did you play any other sports outside of football there? Nah, I wasn't good. Just football. Okay. <laughs> played football at Occidental <laughs> College. He was a, a linebacker and safety for their um team. Um, so his gym focuses on more than just strength training and weight loss. He also likes to bring topics of emotional wellness, meditations and mindfulness, stress management, self-love, and giving yourself grace into conversations with his clients daily. So welcome, Marcus, to House Talk Pregame. How are you this morning? Yeah, well, uh, thanks, uh, Dr. Pitts and Ronnie, you know, for uh, waking me up. I had that alarm, but I had like four of them set just to be safe, <laughs> you know, um, but I'm doing pretty well. I got all the uh, sand out the eyes. Had the coffee before we got on here. Uh, you ain't go, you ain't you ain't go you ain't go catch no surf before uh, you got on here, did you? Oh man, I, so I can't even I can't even swim. So that's that's not. Oh, uh, hi, man. I know, I know, I know, I know. <laughs> I know. <laughs> you you by the water? Come on, man. Come on now. I'll, I'll so, sit. I'll sit by the shore. You know. I feel you. I feel so, Marcus. So, tell us a little about your, a little bit about yourself, man. What what got you into sports? Talk us about your high school career, and then what got what led you to Occidental College to play football for them? Uh, yeah, man. So I I started playing basketball when I was like two years old. Uh, see a little okay. tater tot out there dribbling around, not knowing what I was doing. 
Uh, my dad was a high school player. You know, he played well, he played up to high school. So he wanted me to live into that. Uh, so I think there was always a lot of pressure around like playing basketball. Uh, and I did that till I was about 11. That was my only sport really outside of like uh, some karate stuff that I was half in. Uh, but there was so much pressure on that. And mm-hmm. I don't think I ever like, it was hard for me to have too much fun with it sometimes. Right. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I think uh, when I was 11, I like, we like drove by this like football league. It was like flag football. I was like, oh, I want to do that. And when I went out there, you know, my dad didn't really know too much about like coaching football or football drills. Like he watched it. But because of that, it allowed like there to be a little space and for me to just kind of mm-hmm. like explore and have fun and just kind of be a kid. So I mm-hmm. loved it. Right. Plus, you got to hit people, which we were talking about. Sometimes we miss it. you know. <laughs> but it made it a bunch of fun. Right. So I played a. Uh, Flag football for two years, went over to tackle, played all the way through uh, through high school, you know. Uh, and it's funny because uh, in high school, after my freshman year, I never started. I never started after my freshman year. Even my senior year, I didn't start, right? Um, and then, like, I remember thinking it was over and how, like, depressing and sad that was for me. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I had this one little glimmer of hope come through. They were like, oh, this D3 school is looking for you. Um so for like the next, I would say five, six months, I uh, I was working out like three hours a day, every single day after school, right? Like, you know, I'd be the guy like with all the meals in his backpack, like I would do like an hour <laughs> at night, you know, and it was like that for like five or six months, mm-hmm. a little bit fueled by a breakup that happened at the same time. So it was like the perfect yeah. little storm of oh, everything. Yeah. You had that, that you had that know. perfect concoction right there. 17 year old Marcus was on it. I was listening to Tupac every day. <laughs> I was I was going. Uh, <laughs> and then I went to Oxy and I, I started my freshman year, you know, which was like body change, speed change, everything. And I was like, man, like, wow, like that's what like, you know, even like a short spurt could look like. Mm-hmm. Uh, so flash forward, skip, skip, skip through some things. Uh, Oxy, you know, like good my freshman year. OK, my sophomore year and my junior year. Bad, 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 terrible, bad. Um, so we had the best offense in the conference. Mm-hmm. And we had the worst defense. Oh gosh! So, so, y'all were, so y'all were Kansas City of y'all's conference. Oh yeah, but we didn't <laughs> win. <laughs> we were Kansas City without the wins. We literally oh. our, our quarterback from my from that year. He just got drafted into the USFL, which is D three players don't get drafted, right? Mm-hmm. So he was really that guy, and we just weren't doing our defense. It was like me, one of my roommates that were good. Um, and then, you know, a couple other players here and there, but we just never could put it together. Um, and that hurt me, you know, like I wasn't, I wasn't used to losing. Um, when? We were one and eight. I was not used to oh, losing man. at all. Like, it, cause in, in high school, I think I lost like three times, you know? Wow. Yes. Yeah, so then go from that to going, you know, one and eight, um, ah, man, like playing defense and everybody's like, oh, the defense is terrible. And I have to own that and eat that every day. <laughs> Um, on top of like, you know, it's a D3 school. I'm like, man, I ain't even get no scholarship money from this. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just getting beat up. It may go into practice. It may go into practice. You get beat up for free. <laughs> oh, 6 a.m., especially because they move. I used to be out there before practice. So practice would start at 7, so I'd be out there at 6. But then they moved practice to 6. And I was like. Oh, gosh. Hey, I can't mm. really be I remember them practicing. Like oh, that. <laughs> but, um. You know, so after my junior year, we were kind of uh, just kind of into that next phase. Uh, we were in the weight room. And you you understand this, Ronnie. Uh, Dr. Pitts, I'm not sure if you like, uh, I forgot to ask you if you played any sports. I'm uh, a career fan. Oh, uh, okay. Oh, there we go. Cool. Well, Ronnie, you kind of understand. It's like once you become a senior, you mm-hmm. get a lot of ownership of that team. And like, mm-hmm. it's kind of on you to, to carry the torch. Yeah. Uh, and I was looking around in the weight room, like first workout is me being like, a, uh, you know, going to the senior now. Ah, oh, man. And everybody was like laughing and, and playing and mm-hmm. you know, Uh-oh. taking it serious. And like, I was like, I had the realization. I was like, I can't do this. I can't, I, I can't be the one to kind of like go through that for another year. Uh, so I was going to take a year off. Um, so I told the coach like, Hey, like I'm going to step away from the team maybe take like a year off to kind of like get like some of my love for everything back. Um, and what that turned into was uh, everybody on my football team that was close to me uh, stopped talking to me. 
right? Ooh. So it's all like my friends that I made over those uh, like first three years. And Oxy mm-hmm. is like a very like predominantly white school. It's 1,500 kids only, only 1,500 kids, predominantly white school. There was a time uh, where one of my, one of my uh, teammates, he did a project called the 99. Uh, and I think it was maybe that high, but he took a picture of the 99 black students on campus. Out of 1,500? Out of 1,500. We got a picture of all of them, right? Um, so just with that, right, it's like, man, uh, you know, losing some of those friends hurt. Mm-hmm. right uh and then my other friends like they were abroad they were studying abroad so i was kind of like lonely in that so what i used to do is i used to just go to the gym i'd wake up go to the gym for like two hours go to classes go eat you know go back to the gym go to go study or whatever and then just go to bed mm-hmm. and it's because i was like i was just alone i was like well what do i do at this time you know mm-hmm. it was a real it was it was a real hard real scary time for me um but like beautiful things were birthed out of it. And I'll kind of like wrap all this up. I know it's go, go, go. Oh, you good, man. About. But uh, mm-hmm. yeah, what came out of it was like for me going to the gym over and over, like it gave me a sense of community, right? So mm-hmm. I, I kind of base my business now off of like helping people get out of those two main types of pains. There's a the physical pain I had from being a uh, you know athlete for most of my life. So it's beat up. My shoulders still need some TLC every day. Uh, <laughs> and then there's the emotional pain from, uh, you know, losing all those friends that I had at that time and like just feeling lonely and feeling like, you know, like it was just me, right? Mm-hmm. Um, so with that, like uh, the gym gave me a community. The gym gave me a spot to kind of feel good about myself, to be around people. And even if I didn't speak to them or know them, uh, it gave me a sense of like, you know, you give somebody a little head nod. And psychologically that was so important for me at the time. Mm-hmm. Uh, so after doing that for some months, it became, Oh, hey, Marcus, like, hey, you're, you're always here. Like, could you help me out with this thing? And I was like, uh, yeah, sure. Like, I had a kinesiology degree, so I knew the background and stuff. Uh, but I never really worked with anybody. So I started doing that for a bit. Uh, I went home for summer, for winter break. And I, would, like, spent, like, four days making this, like, ebook, doing all the <laughs> graphics and everything. You know, the it had typos and everything, but whatever. <laughs> and I used to sell those ebooks to afford, like, you know, rent to afford, like, to buy stuff in the cafeteria. Um, I was pushing them hard because we had a senior trip to Vegas and I was trying to go on mm. it with a little cash, you know. <laughs> but yeah, it just started with that, you know. Um, it started with that, it just started with like me trying to help other people get out of pain, like wow. realizing that fitness could be an avenue to kind of help people in more than just their body, you know. And, uh, I was super young. I didn't really know what I was doing. I didn't really know where I was going to go or what the message was going to be. But I knew it always started with that. You know, like, how can I help these other people get out of these different types of pain, physical, emotional, whatever it may be, um, through this medium, Mm -hmm. right? Like, it is just like a medium for for doing it no different than, you know, whatever other people do. Um, It's just the one I kind of, like, stumbled or, you know, God led me into. So, um, Marcus, can you share with us the significance of your logo? It's an interesting logo. I, I, yeah. I feel very strongly there's some meaning behind that. Uh, so <laughs> uh, I'll give you a little backstory on it. Um, so initially, my business was called Two Fit Athletics. It's the corniest name you ever heard, right? <laughs> and I didn't realize it. It never clicked to me. So I started to get some clients. Um, and they were like, we want shirts. You got to give us shirts. And I thought about putting this big orange two fit athletics on a shirt. I was like, oh, hell no, we got to change it. <laughs> so um, <clears throat> I sat down with a few of my clients and we started to brainstorm ideas of like, hey, what is this whole thing about? And I trained like, uh, even back then, it was mostly people 40 plus. Um, and my whole thing isn't like fad diets, right? Like I've seen uh, people in my family, I've seen like clients I've had early on like do this whole fad diet of lose, gain, lose, gain. So mm-hmm. I wanted, I already knew like my whole thing was going to be sustainability um, and doing things that like that work for you long-term. So Ion is basically the uh, the Greek God of unbound time, right? Wow. And it kind of ties into this thing where, hey, like this journey isn't a two month journey. It's not a six week journey. It's not this three weeks before my marriage journey, right? It's understanding that, hey, you know, like this is, a lifelong journey, right? We are thing used to be lifelong strong. 
but then, you know, I couldn't get that copyrighted. So we moved on. <laughs> um, but, you know, it's like uh, that unbound time. We're like, hey, this is something that's going to be today through the rest of your life. Right. And that's kind of what inspired Ion. And like, you know, you got the Greek wings, but also they double as, you know, the little. Uh, angel wings. Rape. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. exactly. It's like angel wings to me. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. So they're like the uh, the angel wings, but also like the like the Roman crowns or the Greek crowns that were like mm -hmm. made out of. Uh, Oh yeah, See? yeah, exactly, exactly. So that kind of inspired like the design of everything. Um, nice. So we've been rocking with the sense, and it just kind of embodies everything that we want to embody here uh, at my gym. Work, Marcus. I wanted to, <clears throat> I wanted to go back for a second. First of all, thank you for sharing your, uh, your, your story and whatnot. That was a very dope and powerful story. Um, I wanted to go back for a second to, you know, when you first started playing football and stuff like that, and you got to high school. And you mentioned that, you know, after your freshman year that you didn't start the rest, you know, of your high school career, but you did play. So let me ask you this. So getting into football and, you know, going back to high school, Marcus, what was what was high school Marcus thinking about or feeling about as far as, you know, did. So let me give a little context. So for me, and I've talked about this on the show before, you know, for me, my identity formed and developed through sports and specifically through football where, you know, my love, confidence, you know, validation and all that was solidified and validated through football. And so I wonder, you know, for you, when you started playing football in high school and things like that, and you were after your freshman year, you weren't starting, did that ever at any point ever affect your self-love for yourself or maybe your confidence within your, your abilities? Or even like, you know, when you became a senior and, you know, the recruiting process, not having schools contact you and reach out to you. How did that affect your psyche or did you, or did it impact your psyche at all? Like was football something that you were like supremely invested in? Like, you know, some, most kids like, you know, if I play football in high school, I want to go to college and play football and, you know, go to the pros yeah. and stuff like that. But for you, was that something that impacted your, your self-love or psyche or was it just kind of like, you know, you knew who you were at that point in time and you knew your abilities and what was realistic for you? Man, so it's actually the opposite. So I, uh, I like function in a lot of spaces, right? Like okay. I was like, you know, like kid with like, you know, quote unquote, like nerdy kid in some spaces, right? Mm -hmm. um, and then I have to go like and be a different person with football. Uh, and then I have to go like, you know, I was in like, uh, my mom like uh, was used to be a performer and an actor. Uh, now she writes books and things, but I used to be in like in a performance arts uh, class as well. Right. OK. I was functioning as a different person in all these areas, which seems like it makes me like this very oh, like he can interact with a lot of people. But it also make me, made me like never really have a true sense of self. And I guess I'm like, mm. you know, I'm high mm. school, you know, so I guess that's all we're already still developing. But what that did was uh, looking back is that I actually if I wasn't performing well in any of these categories, um, it really made me struggle. It really made me like feel like I wasn't fitting in which was already tough to fit in when you're like all in all these different spheres, you know? Um, right. So it was like, man, like when I wasn't starting and just like hearing, you know, like just team crap talk, everybody like just giving each other and I couldn't say anything back. Right. Uh, Cause I wasn't, I wasn't playing, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, and I was tough. It was definitely tough. Um, I think I remember my senior year. Like I, I hated it. I hated everything about my senior year in high school, you know? Um, wow. I think by my senior year, like a lot of like my closest friends on the team had stopped playing. So I probably had like uh, a few dudes there that was still like clue with me. Um, mm -hmm. But outside of that, you know, it was just arguing every day at practice. Just mm -hmm. we had like some transfers that kind of like ruined like the the culture of everything. Oh, you know, yeah. and we still went all the way to the championship because we just like you know we were. I went to a pretty good school, public school, but like we produced a lot of good players. Um, but yeah, it was just like. It was just not enjoyable. Coaching, what happened? Isn't isn't that when you when you describe that type of culture, isn't that something that should be should have been addressed by the coaches uh, and the so team captains? It should have been, mm -hmm. right? But I think even some of the team captains uh, were some of those same people, right? Like uh, the, we had like a our legendary number, like the number that we give to like. They gave like the best defensive player every single year, right? Mm -hmm. And the guy we gave it to was a transfer uh, who like didn't mm -hmm. work hard and like complained all the time. It was always arguing and trying to fight with somebody. And it was like, man, like when you have that guy as your head guy, 
Mm-hmm. You know, like that sprinkles down into everything else. And we saw Everybody that. Everybody else kind of follows suit. Exactly, exactly. Mm-hmm. You know what that reminds me of, though? That rem- and, a, and I think that it's important for us to weave it together so that we can flesh it out for our viewing and listening audience. When you think about when someone comes into treatment with that type of headspace, that, that mm-hmm. type of attitude, that type of um, toxicity and negative energy, that tells me that there is a lack of self-love there because Mm. people who love themselves, people who genuinely and sincerely have the ability to love themselves unconditionally that are self-compassionate, they're not lashing out at other people like that. They're not whining, moaning, groaning, and complaining and being argumentative and combative and, and doing all of these things that cause division. People who actually love themselves, and you said it best earlier, they're light. You, you literally bring light into a room because what do we know to be true about light and darkness? You can be in a pitch black dark room and strike a match, a teeny tiny match, and it will illuminate the room. Light always overcomes darkness. And that's the difference between someone who loves themselves and someone who doesn't. It, it's it's understood. Like when you don't love yourself, you engage in self-sabotaging behaviors. When you don't love yourself, it's hard to make relationships last. So you're not going to get along with your teammates. You're not going to get along with your coach. You know why? Because you're not getting along with yourself. Mm-hmm. You are not getting along with yourself and you're, you're, you're in internal turmoil, which again, where your thoughts go, your energy flows. So you're full of all of this toxicity, all of this negative energy. And that sets the frequency. Like if you ever want to know what frequency your brain is on, what aura you're putting out into the world, all you have to do is look at how you feel. Your Mm -hmm. feelings are the remote control that tells you what frequency your brain is in. And in case I'm, I'm speaking a foreign language to some people, for those of you who took physics, you'll know exactly what I'm talking about. In physics, we learned that everything that as human beings, we're energy. We are energy sources and energy vibrates, right? So even though we're human beings and we have a pulse and blood running through our veins and the whole nine yards, we're still a source of energy. And let me prove it to you. It's like, what the heck is Dr. Pitts talking about? If you have ever walked into a room and you have made this statement, the tension is so thick in here, I can cut it with a knife. How can you feel it if it's not energy? You can feel it. The energy in the room is actually, you can feel it. And because you can feel it, it, it's out here. It's radiating. And the same way with us as human beings. So when you come in with that negative energy, when your thought life is such that you're bringing forth all of that argument and that combative nature and all of those things, it really is a red flag waving that says this person doesn't love themselves. This person is not happy with who they are. This person is allowing whatever it is that's going on internally to, to be externalized. And they are they don't even know where they stop and the other people begin. So it's mm-hmm. this, this messy situation that is, it morphs. It absolutely positively morphs because when you don't love yourself, it's that, it's that much easier for you to be belligerent, obnoxious, nasty, and hateful to other people. Yeah, absolutely. Mar- Marcus, I wanted to ask you a question. So for me, I also, so I would imagine you grew up in a predominantly white area as well, uh, in Pasadena. No, so I grew up in a, I grew up in Reno Valley, which is more like uh, Inland Empire. Um, so we had like predominantly like uh, black and brown like neighborhood growing up. Okay. And that's why so, I made that switch a little uh, extra tough. So I was I was going to ask you about this. So how, so coming from a predominantly black and brown area and going to a school with only fifteen hundred kids and there's less than a hundred you know black kids on there, what was that transition like? And at any point, because I know you mentioned you know going into your senior year, the choice you made to preserve yourself and not have to go through the the stress and the headache of being on a trash team, because there's nothing worse than getting your your body beat to hell on a trash team. So. How was, how was that transition from going from a predominantly black and brown area to a predominantly white school? And then how was that your senior year? 
do you feel like you talked about a lot of your friends from the team and stuff, um, you know, had kind of like, you know, turned their backs on you and really wasn't trying to be understanding or compassionate for where you were coming from. So how was that transition for you? And, and did, did that impact your self-love or maybe some of your self-confidence, you know, during that transition? Yeah, uh, for sure. Real quick, I did want to touch on uh, Dr. Pace because you made a good point. Uh, and I do feel so bad for that, for that kid that transferred over because mm -hmm. now that I'm older, I see that that wasn't his fault, right? Like, that kid was 17, right? And everything that he displayed had to just be what he saw and what he was used to and the frequency he was always yeah. around, right? So yeah. it just makes me sad looking back at that. But uh, to on your point, Ronnie, um, it was uh, it was tough, man. It was extremely tough, right? Like you go to this new place and, and thankfully, you know, two of my buddies, uh, my closest friends even to this day, actually like four of them, uh, you know, from like... Uh, uh, South Central, from Compton, from Long Beach, uh, and then another dude, he's from, like, up north, right? But because of, we were all, like, <laughs> right, like, these black and, like, brown kids who come from, like, not crazy affluent backgrounds, right, you know, like, um, and now we're stuffed into these, this place with, like, all these extremely, like, rich white people, uh, you know, who are paying $67,000 out of pocket for two kids to go there every year, right? It was a complete culture shift. Mm -hmm. complete culture shift right mm -hmm. and it made it seem like everything you were doing was was odd right mm -hmm. the way you spoke was odd right and you know things that you did um and it made it extremely hard to to fit in right especially my freshman year you know you're like oh like call just for networking and it's like okay well hey i'm trying to like make connections with these people but we don't see world life or our experiences eye to eye at all you know, um, and it made it extremely tough, right? It makes it extremely tough when, you know, you play football at a very liberal school. And even though, you know, <laughs> you haven't met a single person, the fact that you're on the football team, you're automatically this, like, you know, jock that they, you know, have stereotype based on what they've seen in the movie, right? Mm -hmm. Before they say a word to you. Um, so it made it extremely tough. Like both of those things in that environment, a black person in this predominantly rich white school, and a football player at this very liberal school. And I think, honestly, Oxy being liberal might have like, I couldn't imagine going to like a super conservative white school. They would have beat me a lot. <laughs> <laughs> but, right, but uh, but those two things together, like, uh, man, my freshman year, I was, I was struggling a lot looking back at it, right? Uh, and I didn't really realize like all the microaggressions and all the things that kind of like impacted me, impacted my self-love, my self-worth, um, mm. you know, uh all that so I started going to therapy years later and I was looking back and I was like man like I was afraid to speak in class because there was a part of me that was like hey I'm like the one to two black kid in this in this class and if I don't say something if I say something stupid that's a reflection of me and my whole race mm -hmm. right and these me people too. that didn't grow oh sorry go ahead Dr. Pitt. No, no no finish your thought because I want to I want to chime in on that from a clinical perspective go ahead yeah right so it's like man like I am carrying the weight of not only myself, but how these people who probably haven't interacted with that many Black people view us. Mm. And that was a lot of weight. It was a lot of stress, like day to day, mm -hmm. uh, as I went through everything. You all are weaving this, this chain um, beautifully. And, and as you're doing it, it's like, I just got a, a, a structure in my head. So as you all are fleshing this out, I'll, I'll intermittently chime in to give the clinical perspective. So to reframe what you said, Marcus, in a clinical context, it identifies two, and there are several key things that I'm going to share throughout the show that it, that's an indication to our audience that they are lacking self-love. And the first one is you're not feeling free to be who you really are, right? When, when you are in an environment, when you talk about the, the, the young man that transferred in and, and how argumentative and combative he was, if that's all he knows, right, he, it, it's a catch-22 because that's all he knows, but that doesn't necessarily mean that that's who he was it, it, at his core, right? Mm -hmm. you, you have to be able to be free to be who you really are. And if you're in an environment where you don't feel emotionally safe to be able to do that, not only does it erode your sense of self, but it is like catastrophic to your ability to love yourself properly because you're not in an emotionally safe space to be able to do that. The second thing that you highlighted is that 
you don't feel free to express your ideas, right? And again, it's about safety. It's amazing how self-love is, is tied to safety. You, you find yourself in this place and space where you feel, not necessarily that it's accurate, because in fact, it may be a cognitive distortion in some settings, but you feel like you have to hold back because if you express how you really feel, then it's going to be detrimental to whatever it is that's going on. And, and Ronnie hears me say this all the time on the show. And I know, I know, I know, I know that the people disagree with me taking this position, but I can sleep at night because Dr. Pitts is authentically Dr. Pitts. And that is, I say that life is not a popularity contest. I could believe that Hollywood has not called me yet because I am so direct. I sugarcoat nothing. Do I know how to behave and conduct myself in various settings? I absolutely positively do. However, whether I'm in the boardroom or I'm on HT or I'm on the block, I'm still going to tell the truth. I may say the truth a little bit more polished, dignified, and refined, but I'm still going to speak the truth. I'm not going to sugarcoat anything for the sake of acceptance. I'm going to be authentically who I am because to your point about God, I believe God made me this way, right? He gave us this personality. And when we find ourselves in these situations where our authentic self is stifled, our ability to love ourselves unconditionally and to have self-compassion is gravely, gravely smothered out. And people need to be aware of that. I've never in my entire life been a people pleaser. Never. I don't give a rat's behind if you like me or not. And I'm okay with that. I am okay. I was like that. How old am I? I'm 54. I was like that at 14. I was like that at eight. And I'm sure whenever I leave here, I'm going to be like that because at the end of the day, a big part of self-love is being so comfortable in your own skin that you can speak freely about how you really think and feel. You, uh, yes, and they're, you know, depending on the environment, how you say it is, is relevant, but still being able to speak your truth is a key indicator that you understand the importance of loving yourself unconditionally because you don't get to validate me. You don't get to, to define who I am and what I believe and what I'm about. And if I allow you to pressure me into status quo, if I allow you to pressure me into doing the dance, then you know what ends up happening? Some people might call me a sellout. And I've been called a lot of things in my life, but a sellout has never been one of them. I'm going to be authentically Lauren at all times. And if you choose to not receive me and my authenticity, that is your choice. I wholeheartedly respect that, but I'm going to go to sleep at night and sleep well, sleep well, knowing that I stay true to me, whether you accept me and my truth or not. Dr. Go ahead, Marcus. I love that, you know, and uh, as you were saying that, right, I think that I was looking back and I was thinking about how much uh, on my end of things, how I think even from a young Marcus, right, mm -hmm. example, like in fifth grade, I remember I got all A's and then the next semester I got all A's and a B and I was crying and I was afraid mm -hmm. to go home and not because I thought I was going to be in trouble, because I thought my mom was going to be disappointed. Mm -hmm. Right. And from football, you know, from a young age, my dad with basketball, it was, uh, and this wasn't at all what he was trying to do, mm -hmm. right? but mm -hmm. there became sports of, Hey man, if I don't play well in this, then I don't, you know, like he's going to be mad. Like I'm not going to receive that same love. Mm -hmm. So I realized mm -hmm. through a lot of it, like it was me like trying to search out and trying to like find validation and find love through mm -hmm. accomplishment, through performance, mm -hmm. you know? that's what made these certain periods of time where I didn't have that extremely tough. So for you, I just kind of want to hear more about, like, I think it'd be dope for our listeners to kind of hear, like, what do you think were some of the things that shaped you and made you kind of be able to look at it as, Hey, like, this is who I am. And this is who I'm going to be uh, mm -hmm. even from such a young age. So <laughs> my mom, she, she, my mom has two labels that she's placed upon me since I was a little girl. 
The first is I'm her miracle baby um, because I'm not supposed to be here. Like I was, I've said numerous times, I was very, very, very sickly. As a child, I came out the womb sick. I was just a sickly, sickly child and have had more flirts and dances with the undertaker than a little bit throughout the course of my life. So on one hand, when I'm her miracle baby, but on the other hand, she always called me her consequence child too, because she said I was, she said I was her consequence child because I have always had such a strong personality like you're you're talking i kid y'all not true story you're talking about a kid who went to i was probably 10 or 11 went to my cousin's wedding up in lancaster county pennsylvania i'm a kid i'm a kid and at the wedding reception and i have a, a memory like an elephant so i don't forget anything at the wedding reception you know everybody's dancing um a one in a million who sang that larry green one in a million was playing and he, he and my cousin weren't dancing, but I went up to him and I tugged him on his tux and I said, you better take good care of her or we're going to get you. Who does that? But that's the level of confidence that I've always had. And I, I, I was born this way. I was absolutely positively born this way. But the beauty and the blessing of it is it was nurtured. You know, many people have you know, heard me say time and time again on the show, I, I have experienced an exorbitant amount of trauma in my life, but I wouldn't change my life's journey for anything. You know, I, I was the, the little kid who, you know, first, second, third grade, I'm doing the big kids Easter pieces and, and the big kids roles in the Christmas program and all of these things. And my parents and my grandparents and my aunts and uncles nurtured that. They always nurtured the, I mean, I believe there were times my mom tried to beat the rebellion out of me. It never worked because I got to the point where I just wouldn't cry anymore. And I would look at her like she was crazy. But true story. Like I really was just like, mm, yeah, I'm not going to cry. I was strong-willed. I was very, very strong-willed. But it, as crazy as this sounds, gentlemen, it served me well. And it has prepared me for who God purposed and predestined me to be. It was, it was just a part of my shaping. And I am so incredibly humbled and blessed and thankful that I'm from a family of really strong personality. Like I'm from a family of freaking alphas. So it's like so many of the, the women in my family, they're just stone cold alphas and they nurtured that and they, they embraced that and they encouraged me to just be me. My husband clowns me all the time. He says, you know, when people talk about if you don't want the truth, you know, it, it, don't ask her to tell you because she's going to give it to you and she's probably going to give it to you raw. And this is what he says. This is his running joke. He was like, do people know who your parents are? Do they know how Paula and George are? They, you can't help it. You can't help but to be who you are. And this, and, and people know, you know, George is, he's the only father I've ever known, but I'm, I'm him. It's crazy because I'm, even though he's not my biological father, I really am this funky split between my parents. And, and depending on what headspace you catch me out, I'm saying my, my inner George is coming out or my inner Paulette is coming out, but I own that. And I take full responsibility and accountability for just being authentically Lauren, because that's how I was raised to be. And I don't make apologies for it because I was taught to not make apologies for it. I was taught that life is not a popularity contest. It's not, it, you get to be who God created you to be or not. You can walk around with imposter syndrome if you want to, but that's a miserable existence. Not being who you are authentically is a very unhappy existence. And I'm like, you know what? I, I literally, here's the running joke. My best friend says, and that's why you don't have no friends. That's why you don't have no friends because people can't, everybody can't handle you. And I really don't, I don't have any friends. My friends, my family member, my, I, my friends married into my family. So we're, we're relatives now. Like I, I have acquaintances, 
I have big sisters in Zion, people that nurture me and love on me. But like, I hear my clients talking about friend groups and stuff all the time. I don't have When I'm going and doing, I'm either in a professional setting with colleagues and acquaintances and associates, or I'm someplace with my family. And I hope that answered your question. I feel like I rambled. I'm sorry. No, but, that's, that was awesome. Um, yeah, but that's, that's why. I don't, I don't know anything else. Yeah, I love that. Right. And I also love like how at the end there was like that, that secondary, like that authenticity, that our authenticity that came through. Cause I was just thinking as well, like, uh, and then Ronnie, I want to pass it back down to you. Sorry. But, uh, oh, you're good. You're good. You're good. Yeah. But I was just thinking like, man, like everything has that, that's two sides to the coin. Cause I was like, man, I think the thing that makes me so good at my job, right. Like mm-hmm. with my employees, with, you know, like with my just people in the community, with all of my members, is that like because I grew up as this person questioning myself, I became wildly empathetic. Mm-hmm. Wildly. Like I could walk in and I could see somebody's eyes with the mask on and be like, yo, what's up? What's happening? Something's wrong what's with going you. What's going on with you? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I could always sense that because mm-hmm. I always was in tune with, well, how does this person feel about me? Or how is this person reacting? Oh, how is my mom and dad? Like, how are they, how are they mm-hmm. right now? Right. And I was wildly in tune with that. So I think like. The negative side of it was like, man, like I did, you know, and even to this day, some question my decisions, right? Search for validation for someone like my business coaches or whatever to say like, hey, like this thing's okay to do. And like, I'm working out of that, right? Mm-hmm. But on the other side, it's maybe like this wildly empathetic dude, like being able to like fit in these different like social circles and, and mingle and interact with people. Um, so I don't know. I just kind of want to hear from like, from Ronnie, like kind of like, where you fit on that spectrum and also Dr. Pitts, like for you. Um, um, can I piggyback on that before Ronnie, when, when Ronnie yeah, and both said it, it's, you both have touched on it and it, and it aligns with what you said. I've, Ronnie, you shared on the show before and Marcus, you've shared it today about how your journey led to spaces in time where you were spending time by yourself, whether it was you, you were just, I remember Ronnie, you talked about running the hill. You were running mm-hmm. the hill, you were running the hill, and you all spent this time by yourself. And I think that it's important for our audience to know too that part of how you learn to love yourself is you have to spend time alone by yourself, not yeah. in an isolated mental nervous breakdown type of way, but you have you got to block out the clamor of life and the and the mental chatter sometimes, and always surrounding yourself with these distractions because it erodes your ability to love yourself properly. And you both spoke to that. So I, I'm, I just wanted to piggyback on that because I want you two to both speak on the benefit of actually spending some reflection time alone with your individual self, okay? So um, Marcus, to your point, um, so I'm the opposite of Dr. Pitts when it comes to self-love and confidence. I didn't find my self-love and confidence until maybe like, hell, honestly, like maybe three years ago. And so because so to make a long story short, I was raised by two traumatized parents. My dad was raised. He was born at the end of Jim Crow and was raised through Jim Crow at the end. My mom was raised in an extremely abusive household growing up. So the way my parents viewed the world and the way they painted the world for me and my sister growing up was, you know, of course, the world is a dangerous place and things like that. And they went out of their way to make sure that we didn't suffer. Now. You, you tell and you ask any parent that in theory, any parent will say that, well, I don't want my kid to suffer. I don't want my kid to have to struggle and go through things. In theory, that sounds good. In reality, that's not how the world works. So like I mentioned earlier, you know, for me, <clears throat> when I started playing football and I realized that I was actually, you know, pretty good at football, that's where my, my self-love, my confidence, my validation, my identity was formed through that because at an early age, at nine years old, I realized like, oh, I'm good at this. People like people treat, because at first I was the fat kid that everybody could just joke on. You know, I was just the fat kid who wasn't gonna defend himself and just, you know, you could say whatever. And I would get, you know, upset. But when I realized like me playing football gave me that confidence to address anybody and and, and have a sense of self that, you know, yeah, don't, don't mess with me. Like, I'm not that one. Like here I am this amazing football player, don't mess with me. It wasn't until football was stripped from me at 22 years old that I realized I had no identity or even an ounce of self-love about myself. To your point earlier about what you were saying with your dad, I always tell people, 
one of my main motivations to be good at football was to not disappoint my parents because my parents, my parents worked really hard to send me to football camps to make sure I had a gym at home I could train in and stuff like that. And so in my mind, as much as it was for me, it was also to get that validation from them. Like, hey, look, you know, I am taking what you have sacrificed for me and I am doing good work with it here. Praise me, validate me, which they did. They did that, but it was through the lens of football. It was never through the lens of just who Ronnie was. Like you mentioned, when you were in high school, your identity necessarily wasn't wrapped all the way in sports, but you had other venture, ventures and avenues. For me, I always tell people, I was all at eight years old or nine years old, my second year of football, I was all in and there was no looking back. There was, there was nothing else. I didn't write a paper in school about anything other than football, unless it was Black History Month, and I'll write about MLK because, you know, that's an easy A. When you write that's everybody's sports. default. <laughs> MLK probably got the most papers written about him in history at this point outside of Jesus. But, <laughs> you know, so it wasn't until I got out of school and I finished playing football. And I always tell people, career-wise, I knew exactly what I wanted to do. To your point, I was a, extremely empathetic from a very early age. I always tell people that I can, to Dr. Pismo, I can sense energy at a level that is just like, sometimes it scares me. To, right. like, to your point, like, I'll go out in public and I kid you not, sometimes I have to be mindful of striking up a conversation because I don't yeah. know if people, like if a sign on me just says I'm a therapist or I'm a, I'm an empath, like, yeah. because I can ask somebody, Oh, how's your day going? Oh man. Like, man, today has just not been a good day, man. My family hates me. Like nothing's going right. I'm behind on rent. I got to feed my kid when I get home. I don't have, to... and you just be like, bro, how you doing? Like, I, <laughs> you I know, just want like, you to be like, I'm good. And keep it going yeah. on. <laughs> Hold on. I'm just, but so I always tell people this, and to Dr. Pitt's point about reflection and being alone, I'm big on self-reflection. And, you know, I, I have a therapist myself that I see, but even, it's funny, like if anybody would ever listen to one of my therapy sessions, I promise you my therapist barely gets a word in because I literally use that hour to self-reflect. I've, I've learned that being accountable in admitting, to, to Dr. Pitt's point about authenticity, I think the most authentic thing a person can be is being able to accept that who they are for what they are in that moment in time. Because if you can live, if you can accept and live your truth, nobody can hold that above your head and hold it against you. And, but that for me, it has taken 28 years to even begin to understand what that really looks like and what that really means. One of the things I always tell people about, about self-love and stuff like that, in order to get the love, there has to be building blocks before that. You have to be willing to accept that, okay, I'm not perfect in whatever sense I thought I was, or maybe something's not right. To mm -hmm. accept it and to acknowledge it, you begin to understand it. And I always tell people, when you understand something, you gain compassion and you gain kindness. And by gaining that compassion and kindness, there is an opportunity to build that love. Mm -hmm. Love, is, I always tell people, love is a secondary emotion because something has to happen beforehand in order for you to register it as love. Oftentimes, a lot to your, to your point, Dr. Piz, and I think it was great that you mentioned about authenticity and stuff and about imposter syndrome. I think for folks who come from traumatized backgrounds and traumatized areas, I think it is almost unfair of them to even ask them who their identity is because they've never been given that safe space to even explore how to begin to form a positive, healthy identity about themselves. Yeah. And so I think a lot of people do run around with imposter syndrome and they run around for external validation because they've never been given that opportunity to learn what internal validation or what it looks like. For me, yes, my parents praise me, love me up and, and all that. And I always tell people, I, I appreciate that because it showed me how to love. It showed me how to understand emotions and deal with them because my mom, my mom was a very emotional person. However, what I didn't learn from that was the ability to regulate those emotions and, and turn it into a, a reflection and self-love that maybe could have benefited me from having the spiraling out of control that I did when I finished playing football. I don't fault them for that. I understand that they also themselves were not given that opportunity to learn about themselves and grow in a space where they could positively have self-love for themselves. I would imagine if they did have that opportunity and did have that space, maybe I wouldn't be the impasse that I am today. So. I was, it's funny that we're talking about this because I just told my therapist on Tuesday. This is literally what I told her. I said, I cannot fix my family or fix the people in my life. However, in order to break a generational curse, somebody has to be the change they want to see. Mm -hmm. 
Yes. I might not, I might not be able to fix them, but if I can be the change and model the change in behaviors that I think will benefit not only me, but my family and the generations forward, my son, hopefully one day his kids and his kids, if I can be the one that models the behavior that I think is healthy for the family, I would like to think that things could change or people's behaviors would change. But at the end of the day, I can only be accountable for myself as the individual. But it took me having to have that space by myself and having to come to a realization that I can't expect people to change my life or change what happened to me. It's up to me. Like me and Dr. Piss always say, and I always tell clients this, from birth to 18, you have no control over your life and what happens to it. Mm -hmm. You strictly, the only control you have is how you respond to it. From 18 until the moment you pass away, that is on you, the individual, to do that self-reflection, to do that work, to do that inner work, to understand, okay, where, where are my weaknesses at? Where, what, what, what are some of the things, the qualities, the emotions, the, the attributes that I wasn't given or I wasn't afforded to? Not because I'm not allowed to have those, because I just didn't have a person in my life at that time to show me how this works. I always tell people, it's not easy work. Choose your heart. It's hard to stay miserable. It's yeah. also hard. To, it's also hard to do the work and get to a point where you don't find miserable in your life anymore. But both are hard. So choose your heart. It's hard. Sorry about that. It's hard to knock things over. I know, right? <laughs> get like a, a bull in a china shop when I get to rambling. But you know, to make a long story short, I, yeah, cool. I appreciate the self reflection and the time I've had to myself to really learn some of the behaviors and things that were passed down for me from my family that I know that I have to fix in order for that my son and his family don't do the same things that I've done. Because if I don't choose to do those things better, I can't expect him to fix something that my that me myself as an adult has refused to address or acknowledge. And I think a lot of adults do that to their children. They expect the kid to fix things and do things differently that they never hold themselves accountable for. And that's not self-love. That's self-shaming, that's self-doubt, that's self-sabotaging because you are expecting somebody to fix something for you that you feel like you don't have the tools, the resources, or the ability to fix yourself. And so I, ho I hope that definitely answers your question, uh, Marcus. Man. Two things did, that you said that I just want to highlight for our audience real quick that gives them insight. Everything you said, if you're not being honest with yourself about your values, in other words, where you come from, what you're about, what you learn, what's important to you, it's a key indication that you're not loving yourself properly. And if you're not being true to your inner nature, which in essence is what you said, it's a key indication that you're not loving yourself properly. Yeah, what they always say, Marcus, the eye in the sky don't lie. Mm. Oh, definitely. And I yeah. think. Oh, I'll go ahead, I'm sorry. Go ahead, no, go ahead. Yeah. No, you got, no, you got, I was just going to, yeah, you good. Oh, uh, all right. Well, two quick stories on it. So first, Ronnie J, I feel like, I feel like you were like speaking the exact say, like, like we're like mirrors almost, right? Because almost Thank everything you, you said was hidden. Because our first one is that Oxy, my freshman year, you had to write this paper. So you didn't have to do like a second English course. And I was nervous. And then it was on MLK. And I was like, oh man, I'm, I'm, I'm come on now. I was gonna write about my experience. And the second one is uh, you were talking about people just coming up to you and just like throwing their whole life at you. I remember I took a, a it was a two hour Uber. I was at a business conference in New Jersey and I had, a, uh, my flight was out of Connecticut. So two hour Uber, way too expensive. Uh, but the, at the beginning, we were just talking about uh, favorite food. And at the end of it, my Uber driver was telling me like her whole divorce history. She was telling me about her biggest fears, her relationship with her dad. I was like. <laughs> TMI, TMI. I was like, 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 you gonna, like you can give me a discount on this Uber on this Uber bill, right? right? Like, like, hold up. This, this therapy session I just gave you. Right, yeah. yeah. This, uh, I'll, I'll bill you for the session, 120. You pay me my 120. But uh. <laughs> But uh, I think uh, a big piece in all of this and like what we're kind of hearing is that I think one of the biggest things people can do for self-love mm -hmm. is just to realize that we're just trying our best, mm -hmm. right? And our best isn't going to be perfect. That's the, that's the thing we have to make a clear delineation on is, hey, what is perfect and what is ideal and what is healthy is different than what may be your best right now. And that's okay. Right. I think there's a lot of like when we look for uh, like you touched on it some like I think having that sports background where from a very young age you are getting coached, 
You are getting compared to other players. It determines mm-hmm. if you start or not. It determines, hey, if you have a good game or not. Your parents, they don't, you know, they love you either way, but you already know Papa Bear was like, oh man, there you go, Ronnie. You was balling out. And on days you didn't, you know, that wasn't the same. <laughs> man, and it and was, was a little different. <laughs> exactly. And it was love all the same. Mm-hmm. But when you're that young, you don't know that, right? So you mm-hmm. ease into like this comparison and this feel like you have to get that validation. You have to perform in order to be loved, yep. right? And that is the worst thing. And it's not on purpose, but it's mm-hmm. one of the things that kind of get picked up. So creating that delineation of, hey, like, I will not always be perfect. I will not always be ideal. I will not always do what I actually want to do, but I'm trying my best. And even when people sabotage themselves, they are mm-hmm. trying their best. Cause I kind of yep. shoot through with my clients. I say, Hey, this isn't self-sabotage. This is what I call safe sabotage. Mm. Right? Your body is trying to go back to a space and a zone that it feels comfortable with. And especially mm-hmm. we've talked about this. Um, when you grow up and you become accustomed to a level of stress, a level of uh, anxiety, a level of just things always happening in the house of being late of Mm -hmm. whatever things that create that internal anxiety and stress Mm -hmm. when you start to raise to a zone that feels outside of that Mm -hmm. your body feels unsafe right like the body and the mind love homeostasis they love to stay the same Mm -hmm. whether that be good or bad the the easiest example and it's kind of cliche at this point is like you know the person that stays in a bad relationship for too long because they're comfortable Mm -hmm. with it right that's because our mind doesn't like to do too much work so we can associate ourselves with something. Our mind says, hey, this is Marcus at this frequency. I know how to react to all these situations that come here, right? But if you were to be a different person, your mind would have to then rethink and recalculate every way that you react to these things. So that's the reason when people start to make changes, whether it be in fitness, whether it be in how much they show themselves love, whatever else it may be, there's an extremely hard period, right? Mm-hmm. Because you're really stripping off and like letting go Mm -hmm. and forgetting all the ways you used to react to things. Mm -hmm. And your body has to go through this very, very painful. And even if it doesn't seem like it, you're just like, you, I don't know if you two had it where you're like trying to do something. You're like, oh, why do I keep every time this thing's going well, I Mm -hmm. I do blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. Right. And it's because your body feels unsafe in that initial period. Mm -hmm. You haven't proven to yourself that you can do this other thing, right? Like, uh, easy examples um, you know let's just take like w- whatever I'll just throw this out here like let's take like alcohol right mm-hmm. and someone is starting off and like as a kid whatever they, they started drinking and that became the way that they soothed their pain because zero to 18 you don't have many options right you learn to find your voice you learn to soothe your pain you learn to deal with these things mm-hmm. in whatever way is possible for you when you don't have actual choice or boundaries mm-hmm. Right. So then when that person grows up, that's what they grew up with. And their body knows that their body trusts that their body feels safe with that. But they're like, hey, I actually want to try this new thing. I want to try meditation, journaling. I want to try whatever else. Mm-hmm. Your body is scared. Mm-hmm. And it's like, whoa, whoa, that's my thing. Like that is my uh, what's that uh, peanuts? That is my minus blanket. Mm-hmm. You know, trying to take my blanket away. Mm-hmm. Right. And it's like we have to give ourselves grace in that period. We have to give ourselves we have to understand that even in those periods where we're trying to make those changes, that it's not going to be here, right? Like you are going to make some progress and you are going to sabotage yourself and you're going to make some progress and you're going to have a flat line. And all of that is a reflection of you trying your best. One of the biggest things my financial coach told me is I came in one day uh, and I was just trying to set up this like uh, this new account when I was going and I was frustrated. And I stayed up late because I knew I had the meeting and I didn't want to show up to our next meeting feeling unprepared. Right. I didn't want him to think that I was wasting his time. Mm -hmm. And he said to me, he said, Marcus, slow down. He said, now I want you to listen to everything you just said. And if you said, if a friend said that to you, what would you think? Right. Because I was like, man, Billy, like I keep just trying to do this thing, man. And I I feel like I'm not making any progress. I'm I'm trying hard, but I just keep messing it up. And he was like, because to me, you know, to you, you seem like someone who's messing this thing up. And you're not getting it right and you're never going to get it right and you're just dumb or whatever else but to me you're someone who's trying really hard and you're going to figure it out because you're continuing to try hard right so it's just realizing that hey like i am trying my best and also when we look at others like 
you know, I don't give judgment to other people, whatever their situation is, because I also understand, like, yo, like, this person is, they're trying the best they have with what they have, you mm-hmm. know, and I think that's, like, a, a super amazing, like, starting point where we do talk about conversations of just, like, self-love in general, you know? Let me put that in clinical context real quick in the instance of, we got 11 minutes, and I'll, I'll hit you, give me two seconds. Um, what you described, Marcus, is when I'm talking with my clients, what I define as the discomfort, the dis-ease, and the discontent of the comfort zone. And what a lot of people don't realize is that fear and anxiety are the perimeter of the comfort zone. It's the reality that they know. It's what they've known their whole life. So to your point, because the perimeter of the life that you've always known is fear and anxiety, you it's like hitting a brick wall. You have to make a conscious decision to push beyond that perimeter to get outside to the infinite possibilities of the more and the different and the better that you des- desire for your life. Ronnie, hit that. And then I'm going to give our audience the, the remaining uh, indication of, that they're not loving themselves properly. And then I want us to, to spend the remaining eight minutes um, telling them how to love themselves properly. Go ahead. So Marcus, you, you said that so beautifully, man. And, and one of the things I like to share with people, it, it's a quote that I uh, found last year. And it it summarizes everything both of you all said so beautifully. People change when the pain they're in is greater than the fear of the unknown. Mm -hmm. And to your point, I always tell people, you know, when we think about people, you know, trying to change and and grow on a journey and stuff like that, everything you said is, you know, people get to a a point where good is bad and bad is normal. And Mm -hmm. when bad becomes normal, anytime something, to your point, oftentimes what people do is it's not that they, it's not that they fear the change itself is the fear of, am I worthy of keeping this change? Mm. People who are so used to good. bad things happening all the time, it becomes normal. Mm-hmm. So when something good happens, it's not the fact that they don't want the good thing to happen. It's mm-hmm. the fact that I know I have no control over if this good thing comes or goes. Mm-hmm. So while it's here, I want to enjoy it. But in the, my all of this in my head is how long is this good thing going to last? What's going to take it away from me? Or will I mess it up myself? And what you see is people, when, to your point, when they get to that uncomfortable stage, when they get to that fear and anxiety stage of change and of progress, they resort mm-hmm. back to what's normal to them because they feel like themselves, well, nothing in life has told me that I'm worthy of this change or this good thing mm-hmm. happening to me long term. And what mm-hmm. I tell them is, you know, look, good and bad things happen to everybody. That's just life. That's just the reality of it. Nobody is excluded, mm-hmm. excluded from bad things and nobody just get good things happen to their life. However, you to your point, you have to be understanding and patient with yourself and be kind mm-hmm. enough to yourself to know that life is a marathon. I always tell people, the moment you stop thinking that you get to an age or a point in your life where you can't continue to learn about yourself and grow, you die. Mm-hmm. That's right. You might still physically be alive, but spiritually you're dead if you feel like you get to 40, 50, 60 years old and there's nothing else to learn in life or there's nothing else to change or grow from. So mm-hmm. I, I love the way both of you all said that. Um, Dr. Pitt, do you want to kick us off with uh, what we can do to, to uh, improve our self-love? Let me let me tell them real quick. I'm just going to run down the list real quick. The, the other hints to themselves that they're not loving themselves properly. They're not spoiling themselves enough. They're not mm-hmm. pampering themselves. In, in other words, their self-care is not where it needs to be. They're mm-hmm. not giving themselves positive feedback. They're not taking pride in their physical appearance. They're not taking pride in their intellectual abilities. Ooh, stop dumbing it down. Stop dumbing it down. You're not appreciating all that you do. You're not comfortable about letting others know your intellectual opinions. You're not happy with the image you present. You're not able to confide in those that are closest to you. You're not able to open up to those you love. You're not able to have fun when you're by yourself. I do a whole lot of giggling by myself and I I have plenty of sense. (laughs) So that's some key indications to you folks that you're not loving yourself properly. Now we're gonna give you a quick rundown. We have like seven minutes. Um, We're just going to give you some insight of what it looks like and feels like to love yourself properly. I'll give the first couple. Talking to and about yourself with love. Prioritizing yourself. Silencing the internal negative narratives and choosing to say kind, loving things to yourself, not calling yourself names. Don't say things to yourself that you wouldn't say to somebody that you love and care about or to a stranger. You're not going to walk up to a stranger and be like, you know what? You're you just you're ignorant. You're just fat, black, and ugly. I don't even know why. You know what? What makes you think you're going to be somebody going to pay attention? You wouldn't say those types of things to 
to a stranger or somebody you love. I will. So why do you say those things to yourself? Giving yourself a break from self-judgment, trusting yourself. Gentlemen, feel free. Marcus, I'll let you go. I'll let you go first, man. Yeah, I, I honestly think, because I'm one of the people with the harshest inner critic. And one of my tasks for one of my mentors was literally uh, is to create this bubble, right? And to think, you know, uh, you know, like step away from that self-judgment. Because I find myself 30 to 40 times a day going from, Marcus, that was such a stoop. That was an interesting decision that's part of your journey right now, right? And it's just reframing that. I think that's a huge piece of self-love. Uh, mm -hmm. Making promises to yourself and keeping them is a huge one, right? Like reaffirming your self-love in that way. That's a huge mm -hmm. one. And start small with those things. Um, mm -hmm. I think those are like two of the biggest ones. It's like step away from that self-judgment in your journey and make promises to yourself that you keep. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So I had a, a list of uh, seven uh, quick tips that you can do to help out with self-love. Some of um, some of what Dr. Pitts has said and uh, Marcus mm -hmm. as well, but I'm just going to read through the, the seven that I had um, sure. had wrote down. So the first one is recognize that you are experiencing emotional distress or mental suffering. Like we said, the first step with anything and change, growth and all that is willing to recognize and accept that it is mm -hmm. something there, which leads me into number two, accepting that the feeling is there. Number three, imagine what you might feel if you saw a loved one experiencing this. Like Dr. Piss and Marcus said, you know, if you saw a loved one going through this very same thing, what uh, what advice or encouragement or support might right. you give that person? Right. Because if you're going to give that, if, if that will be your answer, your treatment option, then why can't you give that to yourself? Right. Number four, challenge your negative story about yourself. Marcus just said it beautifully. In the moment you feel that a negative thought or a negative feeling is going to is engulf your mind, Simply tell yourself, stop. This is yep. a challenging moment right now. This is a difficult moment. This is a, like Marcus said, this is an interesting choice or interesting decision you've made in your current moment right now. Number five, think about how everybody messes up sometimes. Like Marcus said, we can all be our harshest critic and our own worst you know, enemy and stuff like that. And sometimes when we get consumed in a, a struggle or a situation, we feel like, yo, I'm the only person out of 8 billion other people on this earth that's going through this. Eight billion people, I'm the only one that's going through this. And it's easy to do that because once again, sometimes we can get go so consumed in, in a situation that we feel like there is nothing or nobody that can help me through this. That is not true. And sometimes some people don't wanna hear that, look, you're not the only one going through this. But the reality is you are not the only one going through this. Doesn't make what you're going through any less valid or any less serious. However, you might not have a reference point in your life for this specific situation but there is somebody out there who does or who has a story similar to that. And maybe their encouragement, maybe their support or their advice can be something that you can utilize. Decide what it would take to forgive yourself. Like we said, it's one thing to accept and acknowledge that, okay, because of your, your mindset and because of your behaviors and things like that, you might have said or done things in the past that you might have resentment or regret about. That's fine. Understand this. Yes, we can, yes, sometimes you can be defined by one choice or one decision, but that is not fair to that person for you to define your entire life off of one situation or one moment or one decision or one thing that you said to somebody. Learn to forgive yourself. You cannot have self-love and compassion if you are not willing to forgive yourself and understand that you are a growing, ever-evolving adult every day of your life. Use self-talk to encourage yourself. Use self-talk to encourage yourself. It is okay to talk to yourself in a moment of trying to better yourself and hype yourself up. Hell, if one of my greatest examples is Kanye West. Kanye West always says, if you don't believe it yourself, nobody else will. No matter how much you try to promote something, no matter how much you try to sell something, you can't sell faith. You can sell authenticity like Dr. Pitt said. And if people recognize you being authentic about yourself and about your product, then yes, they will believe. But you must believe first. Yes. Last but not least, not only be so, not only be a self talker to yourself, but be a life coach to yourself. Mm -hmm. This is your life. This is your experiences. This is your mind, your perspective. Nobody else will always understand your perspective, your mindset, your ambitions, your goals. And it's not for them to always understand. It's for you to be able to understand yourself and where you're at in this moment in life and where you are going. Because at the end of the day, you came in this world by yourself. You leave this world by yourself. So you must be okay with what you have done as the individual. And so those are my tips that I have for how to start to begin to build self-love and self-compassion for oneself. So I want to, I'm going to close us out with ways to practice, right? You have to be true to yourself. You have to be nice to yourself. 
here's a huge one. You have to set healthy boundaries. Mm -hmm. Setting healthy boundaries are about preserving the integrity, health, and strength of your relationships. And more importantly, it's about protecting your overall well-being. Become mindful. You, you have to understand yourself. Spend time with yourself so that you are clear on who you are and really be clear on what you're thinking and what you're feeling and what you want. Take actions based on need rather than want. Practice good self-care, mind, body, spirit. Make room for healthy habits, eating, thinking, feeling, communicating, all of it, working out the whole nine yards. You've got to do it all. This is what I want to leave you with folks today. This, oh my goodness, this has been such a powerful, powerful show. How you see will determine where you go in your life, including how you see yourself. Your future is a product of your perception of yourself. Learning how to see for a change could be the most important thing you do in this transitional season of your life. When your context is wrong, your conclusion is wrong. You may have heard it said, when you change the way you look at things, the way you look at things will change. Context is all about perception. I wanna remind you of the power within you to see for a change. I want you to be encouraged, empowered, and equipped for the new that lies ahead of you for your life. If you truly, 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 as a person of black or brown hue, want to honor black history every single solitary day of your life, love yourself wholeheartedly, holistically, and compassionately every single day, period. Point blank, pain and simple. Marcus, we love you, man. Your family now. We have Damn. officially adopted you into the XT Free Game family. Thank you so man, much for joining us. Please. But he's coming back. He's going to be oh, back. Yeah. He's going to be back in the spring. He's coming back for, for another show so you get to see him again. Look, folks, don't forget, download that HSRN app. You know what? It's We're doing the darn thing. We want you to get the app and to listen to all of our shows. It's all about Harrod Sports Radio Network, about what we're doing for the heart, mind, spirit, and soul for HBCU families all over the country. That's all we have today. Enjoy the rest of your weekend. Stay warm. Enjoy the sun. Go stand on the beach. Marcus. Cali Beach is out here, man. Hey, man, I saw it was 39 degrees last night in L.A., so, you know, I don't know right. about going to that beach uh, today. Yeah, like... So, <laughs> here you go. It, uh, it was a heat warning. Mm -hmm. And then it hailed and thunderstorm and lightning. And then it was a heat warning. And then it was cold for three days. And then a another heat warning on Monday. So California, I don't know. Mother Nature is bipolar. She needs yeah. us as therapy. Yeah. Sure. yeah. All right, folks. That's it. That's all we have for you today. We love you. We'll see you back next weekend. Bye, everybody. Have a good weekend.